shift to March. <laughs> that was my toy, and he said, oh, that's right. I'm at the captain for this and me. <laughs> um, first of all, anyone leave this in the change rooms? Bit, bit. Uh, David Angley. Maybe give it to Blackie and then when they pick it up they can pay for the fine. It's Blackie, Blackie here. Collateral, mate. Okay, thanks, um, thanks very much for coming along. Um, um, I'm going to introduce Jenny Williams. I, I did put out a, uh, a bit of a uh, memo last night on the player's um, Facebook page about Jen's career. If I went through it again, honestly, it would take half an hour because of the achieve, achievements Jen has made in sport and in life in general. Um, given where we're at in our footy world, um, the last few weeks, we just uh, we just fine tuning a few areas that need to need a bit of help. And um, knowing the Williams family for the last 25 years or so, and having the privilege to see Foss, her dad, and her, her brothers uh, Mark, Stephen, and Anthony, and Jen herself, um, what they've done in life in general with sport and um, um, and football has been enormous. But uh, as I said, going back one step with what's happened in the last few weeks, um, it's just a great opportunity for Jen to come along and talk about um, philosophies in sport and uh, in life in general. And uh, I just really like you to sit back and, and listen and, and absorb and take on board what Jen's got to say. And uh, obviously with Dr. Mark as well. Dr. Mark's uh, Jen's partner. and uh, also, sports GP. Pretty amazing guy. Probably the same, same, uh, <laughs> same agenda as Jen as well. <laughs> so Jen, on behalf of Brighton Footy Club, uh, thanks, welcome here. And, uh, and I know you'll be absorbed by it all. So enjoy. And thanks for coming. Hi everyone. Um, I can talk pretty loud. I make a fairly good coach because I can yell across the ground. What John didn't say is I'm a psychologist. After applying years and years of elite football, uh, sport, from all different sports, I went out and said, uh, back to, I was a teacher at Sacred Heart, I've been a PE teacher for years, went back and did my grad dip, honours, masters, and became a psychologist. And then I started dealing with people, and what I found is most of the psychologists deal with what I call normal, which is average. And I decided, no, the world thinks quite differently. So when I used to sit in team meetings and they'd say, never talk back to an umpire, I'd be the one going, why not? Sometimes they change their mind. And so I started to find out what every other great elite person did. And I found there was a whole thing of behaviours and things that are different. If you listen tonight, be very afraid if you were sitting there. I am not one of those nice people who goes, oh, yeah, we'll just let everyone. I treat you like I do a team. I will ask you a question. If you get it wrong, I don't care. Have a go. Because I want you tonight to understand if you want to be great on a field, you have to be prepared to have a go and be wrong. Making mistakes makes you great as long as we do things differently afterwards. And that is what we're going to talk about tonight. So my book is called Think, Prepare, Play Like a Champion. It is not to be normal. This is to make you, if you listen tonight, I guarantee every one of you will be at least... 5% if you do one of the things differently. So, I want to talk to you about getting your head into the game. Ch champion thinking wins. What you learn will actually not only be good for you on the field, it's going to work for you in life. It will make you a better partner. It will make you a better, if you're a dad, better dad. It will make you a better player. And teams learn together. Teams help each other. It is not... If you send one person to me to actually help or get better, that costs a lot of money. I am so pleased to be invited here today because I am so sick of saving the world one elite player at a time. To get to an entire group of people where you're going to have an opportunity to try some things, you are going to be better. But you will learn lots, you're going to improve your performance, your team's going to get an edge from tonight and you will understand each other a lot better. This is what my program looks like, so I hope you can see it. And the whole thing usually goes like this. Uh-oh. Wait a sec. We had it working before and all of a sudden.
actually I might just worry about that. Oh, it's muted. Thank you. Uh, how the heavens He's a champion. No, that's on, the, that's on the computer that's yeah, muted. Just click on the... Yeah. Okay. Configure. Let's just test it. Sounds Doesn't it? Sounds working. Yeah, no, that's... No, that's not. That's, see, it's on TV. Cool. So, try next again. Yep, sorry. It was working before. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we trust it. Yeah, that's what we tried it and it was working. Next. Front right. Next. Finish. Oh well, if it doesn't work, we'll work it out. Okay. That is a Sony TV. Sorry? Can you click on Sony TV? Do it again. So, volume up. I've no idea why it's not working. Do you want to just plug in the speaker? Yeah. Okay, don't worry about this. We'll just watch it without this. Luckily, like anything else, we bring a spare speaker all the time with us, just in case. But the whole idea of, in the middle of this is care. Care for each other, care about the result, and care for your mates. And basically, you need to understand this. I've got caught up there. I was working there in 2004. Probably the biggest thing you will see at the end, that's the most important thing for me, is watching my brother at the reunion in 2014. Yeah, see, it's working on there. And it's got a good song and everything that usually goes to it, you know, like other things, so you don't get there. Um, you luck onto a shot. Just let it go down. Just like the... Computer I'll just get rid of that. Alright, um, we'll just get rid of that. Sorry I didn't get to show you everything, but basically what I want to tell you about is there is a program to make you better. Nearly anyone who spent lots of time in here, who's done some sports science training? In fact, who's done the shuttle test before? Who's done a beat test? Everyone. Who's done lots of skill training? Who's done lots of psych training? Now, do you hear this thing all the time when they keep going, you play 80% above your shoulders and everything? I laugh because if that was right, you should at least do something. And most people don't do anything. This guy's name is Daniel Kahneman. He's an old psychologist. He won the Nobel Prize for proving that almost everyone does herd behaviour. So all footy clubs do the same as other footy clubs. He actually won the Nobel Prize because he said if you are, he won it for economics, if you have a lot of money, you'll probably spend it being told by a financial advisor how to spend it. Most of them, the difference is tossing a coin. You may as well have just tossed a coin as to where, the, where you put your money. And he actually proved all of this stuff and he talked about there are two ways that you think. System one thinking is how nearly everyone hits the footy field. It's how much everyone does in life. It's called, that's the only acronym you'll see tonight, well there's two, that one, what you see is all there is. In other words, this is how you've been coached. This is how you've been coached before. This is how often your coach has been coached. And people don't open their minds to go, is there another way of doing it? And generally, people make emotive, fast judgments. So often coaches will look at a player and go, yeah, can't do that. And then they repeat it to another player, to another coach. And then they repeat it to another coach. And someone like John T. Scharenberg probably doesn't get drafted. Because someone decided he wasn't such, he might have been fast enough, who knows what. He's all Australian twice, but doesn't get a go. Now, this is one of the things we know is if you have an opinion and I like you, I'll probably listen to your opinion without asking questions. So, some of you are going to go in here, ah, oh, I've never heard this stuff before. Well, this is what I want you to walk out here to doing tonight. Critical thinking. You're going to evaluate. So, if you think I'm saying something tonight that's crap, you go, Jenny, where'd you get that from? All right? You are allowed to question. If you want to be great, instead of doing what everyone else does, sometimes ask a question. 
And I'm going to show you why later on hardly anyone at Essendon asked a question and why they got banned because no one did. It's hard to do. But the greatest people make good judgments because we look at it and we evaluate. So my darling husband there, three, four years ago, we were in a, um, a netball change room, so I was watching him all get in the ice bath. And I went, there is no bloody way you would get me in an ice bath. And Mark went, well, you have to get in. It's what you need to do. And I said, show me the evidence. And I now know there is absolutely no evidence for that. And in fact, it may hamper injury recovery. <laughs> so again, almost you guys will be about five or six years behind most of the cutting edge stuff because we adopt it and we keep following what people do. And I want you to walk out of here going, ah, Jenny would say, why do we do that? So I had, a, when we were at port, the guys were drinking beetroot juice because they weed different colours sometimes. And I'm going, how are you possibly doing this? Oh, it's going to give me a 0.001%. And I look at it and I go, yeah, but just knowing how to control your anxiety is going to give you another 10%. Oh, yeah, but no one does that. That's weird. Oh, we don't like to talk about what goes on in our heads because, you know, like only weird people do that. Well, that is what's going to give you an edge. We're going to take time and effort and you're going to take practice to use it. There are three things, aspects that you need to know. Number one, you're the star. You can be a little star or you can be a big star. I'd rather you be a big star. But if I start telling you off, telling you how bad you are, telling me you can't do things, you get smaller. All right, it's a really easy formula. So there's you. You're the individual. Then there's the coach around you or all the people around you that make you bigger or smaller. And last of all, there's all this stuff that goes on in team. Has anyone ever heard of social loafing? <laughs> oh, yeah, you, Bryce has to because he sits with me at tea and I sort of go, if you want to get an edge. Social loafing is fantastic to know about because if one, two, three, four, five guys can all lift 100 kilos, you know, push it, and they did it with the rugby guys. It was great. 100 kilos, 100 kilos, 100 kilos, 100. When you all got together, you should be able to do 500, wouldn't you think? Maybe even a little bit more because you'll try harder. But what we know is if it's not, if it's maybe not the biggest game or it's a little, you take your foot off the pedal a bit. You do too, you do too, you do too, you do too. By the end, everyone does about 60% of what they can do when they're actually in a group. It's a pretty bad thing, isn't it? So if you're playing an easy team and you wonder why they get an edge on you all of a sudden sometimes at the start of the game, it's because everyone else is going, oh, my mate will be all right, he'll play well. But we all take our foot off a little bit. And that's social psychology. And it can change how things are. This is the formula. So in other words, if you want to know what makes a star, what makes you great, this is the formula. It works. Care is in the middle. Bryce wrote it on the board. I know because I asked him, did you write care on the board when you did that? And he goes, yeah, it got rubbed off. And I'm like, ah, lucky I wasn't there. Because I'm telling you, that is the thing that is going to keep you happy and healthy when you are old. I would like you to win a premiership this year. You know why? Because it's with other people. And if you're, uh, if you're one of those people in the team that goes, it's all about me all the time, in 10 years' time when it's a reunion, no one will invite you. In 20 years' time, you'll be a sad person. And as I said to someone, all of our swimmers care about the result and care about themselves. And then in 20 years' time, there's no one to share your gold medal with. You need to understand we make memories at these clubs and in 20 years' time, that's what I want you to do. And I'm even going to talk to you about how many old blokes do you invite back to actually help because they need connection as well. Around the outside is mastery. And I'm not, I don't have time, but if you were coming to me as a site over the time, not only would you learn about all of these things, you would actually have to do some homework and get better. Mastery is hours. Hours count in two things, the amount of practice that you're doing, the time you spend on it. If you, uh, yeah, O'Sullivan's Beach Lions rang me up to come and do a talk for them the same time that Aldinga rang Shane Crawford up to go and play for him. So they had Shane Crawford and O'Sullivan's Beach had me. What I'm really proud of them was when we actually went through, they didn't have one player who got paid. They had no one who played league football before. No wonder they were on the bottom when they're playing other people who've got a lot of experience. So what we looked at was, well, not only is it what's on the field that counts, it's also what's in your club rooms. So I said, look at this place. It's shocking. Got any tradies? Yeah, I'm really good at electrician. 
So what have you done around the club? So we not only put in place things to do for men, but we went and did training on the Oval and the under-18s asked the next time I come back and I took training again if they could come again, which I think is a pretty good thing because they started to understand if you want to get an edge, start doing it early. Mastery is how many hours? Talent, knowledge, ah, luck. I'm going to talk a little bit about luck in a sec. So we'll just go through these things. Uh, probably, can we hear anything, Mark? No. There are rich teams and there are poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap and then there's nothing. Welcome to Open. My job is to take this team to the championship. I need more money. We're not going to We're not going to compete with a hundred and twenty million dollar payroll. You've got to think bigger. <laughs> Your goal shouldn't be to buy players. Your goal should be to buy wins. Who are you? There are these 25 players that have been overlooked by every other team for one reason or another. Like an island of misfit toys. In here is a championship team. One that we can afford. Who's the kid? The kid is the new assistant GM. We're going to shake things up. Tell me. You want me to speak? We're not pointing you yet. It's the new direction of the Oakland A's. We are card counters at the blackjack table. We're going to turn the odds on the casino. You don't put a team together with a computer, Billy. Really. Adapt to die. I want to teach you always to keep learning, to keep going just because another group do it like that, do we do it exactly the same way? And when I said there's a formula, if you don't have self-raising flour, who's the bounciest person in here? Who are the ones that make training fun? Stand up if you make training fun. <laughs> Anyone else? Papa. Who else Langer. would you put? Langer. Who's Langer? Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> Love his face. Give you a big smile. Listen, if you do not have bouncers, your team, when things go wrong, start to get smaller and smaller. If your bouncers stop bouncing because they're getting yelled at or told off, the team will get worse. Start to understand every team needs a few people with joy, hope, and that may have the worst jokes in the world, but you love having them around. Would that be right for some of those two? Important. Now, here's a concept. Has anyone ever heard of entropy? Ah, someone's heard of entropy? A couple of people have. Oh, yeah. Um, when we're doing entropy, I first asked my husband, darling, why do all the clothes end up on the floor in our bedroom? This is a really important answer for you guys to know. Just say entropy. All right, entropy. And I had no idea what it was, so I've gone, oh, yeah, smart man. What are you trying to tell me? Entropy means if we don't put in any effort or we just leave things like they are, everything goes to its lowest form of energy or chaos. So in other words, nearly all of you, whether you are prepared to put in some extra effort in training, whether you're prepared to do anything, and when I do a talk, the biggest thing is most people hear things and they go, oh, that was really great. Or they go to another talk and they go, that was excellent. But what we know is afterwards, see this little number under underneath here? This is a bell curve and every athlete needs to know it. Every athlete needs to know why you need to do maths. Because if you don't understand averages, you don't understand going back like everyone else does, being the same as them, this is normal. 68% of people are normal. Who wants to be in that group? Most people want to be normal. Yeah, teenagers love being normal. Champions sit up here. And the difference between champions and normal people is when they hear a good idea or they read something or they find someone who's an expert, normal people do nothing differently. They go back and do exactly what they've done before. Champions go, wow, that was a good thing. I read Kahneman's book and we changed every bit of our banking. We changed every way we did something based on the best knowledge in the world. Two things differently. Ah, want to be an absolute champion? Champions fall up here. We are not normal. They do things differently. So from here today, if you hear some ideas and you go, that's a good idea, I might write that on my phone. And I'll go, amazing, you're starting to get there. Or I've got a perfect memory, I'll remember it. Or maybe I'll buy Jenny's book or I'll find out, I'll go online and have a look what she's talking about. So, this star, what we're doing tonight will either make you bigger or smaller. Your choice. Let's make you bigger. Main thing is this thing. Concept of flow. Anyone ever heard of the word flow? In the old days, they used to say there was an inverted U for psychology. Up the side is the challenge of the event. How hard something is, 
Along the bottom is how good you are, skills and competencies. So how good you are will be made up of physical stuff, mental stuff, and things like uh, technical stuff, or your kicking, etc. So you are either going to be very low or very high. Up the sides to challenge the event. What makes an event harder? You give me an answer. What makes something harder? I like that. Who are you playing? Excellent. In the red. What makes something harder? I love that. Injury condition. What makes something harder? Score. Score? Absolutely. Answer. What makes something harder? Uh, weather. Weather? Absolutely. On the back, what makes with the Soho written on his top? What makes something harder? Uh, maybe some tactics like replaces like you tag or something. Love that. Excellent idea. If you're on the field, a tag would definitely do that. How you feel? How you feel? I love that too. See, your dog might have just died. And if no one else knows in the team about it and it's your favourite dog or something's gone wrong, that can actually add to your challenge for the day, which is why I keep talking about this care. You've got to know what's going on in each other's lives. You've got to be there and you've got to help. So the challenge of the event, what about finals? Do they make it harder? Ah, now let's go to another one that's my favourite called expectation. You're supposed to win. That sends it up again. So you can be... In the middle is flow, and have a look, it's like porridge. See the diagram down the bottom? Emotional, too cold. Too cold. So they're the easy games, when your skills are better than the challenge. Do you have any of those, win any by 100 points? Anyone in here like me, my worst games were when we won by 100 points, because I would be bored as hell and just go, oh, someone will want to be a hero today, all right? That, that's forward and that's where you've got to be a bit careful just in case the other team kicks in and you're doing social loafing. Ah, in the middle, porridge, just right. Now, what do you notice is the word in green next to just right? What's the word? Starting with a T next to just right? Thinking, thinking. How many of you have been told the most important thing that you can take onto a football field is your ability to think? It is more important than anything else because as soon as you can think, you are calm. Calm people influence the scoreboard. When you, the challenge goes over the top from what you are actually good at, you become anxious or angry or freeze. Those three things. Hands up, you can be two of them sometimes. Hands up those who, when they're a little bit over the top, Get a little anxious before games. Anyone? Anyone get a bit anxious? Fantastic. You won't be soon. You'll be learning about it. Anyone get a bit angry? Yeah, excellent. Anyone get a bit angry at home? Anyone get a bit angry after they have a few drinks? Understand all of this is important because I need you to understand once you are anxious or angry or freezing, you are no longer thinking. You are emoting when you're out there, which means you are not making the best decision who to give the ball to. You're just giving it. You're just doing that without making any sense in what you're doing. So I need you to teach you. We've got two things we need to do. One is increase your skills. So tonight you're going to learn some psych skills. The other thing is to bring the challenge down. How do you do that? You do that by setting good practices to get better. And we had a bit of a discussion the other day. I am a coach that will say, if you're 100 points up, I want you to try using your other foot. And people go, oh, but we don't do that. That's, that's disrespectful of the opposition. I'm going, for me, I don't care how old you are, I want you to get better. And if we're winning by a lot, that's your time to chuck. I have a lacrosse team of women that I went and watched the other day and I've just started coaching them. They can all throw left-handed. So I watched them in a game the week before I coached them and not one on the field actually did it during a game. So we went out to play the top team last week and I said, you will, when you need to, change hands. I don't care if you make a mistake. You will get better. Because this is round one. I want to win by the end of the year. And if I can make them feel like they can have a go in round one and two, by round three, we can do anything. So again, start understanding this. Now, this is what happens. When the feelings are flow there, and I'll just stand out the road so these guys can see, when you're anxious, you will have a fast heart. Dry mouth, cold hands, feeling sick, uh, looking tired, scared, nervous number ones, nervous number twos. I bet your toilets are really full before games. And chucking up. That means you are not in the zone. That means you are above where you need to be. 
In the middle, you can think and act. Everything seems easy. You can actually tell other people what to do. Captains need to stay in that zone. That is the biggest thing that captains need to be able to do. At the bottom, feeling sluggish, not switched on or lethargic. Those two green lines are heart rates. Isn't that amazing? There's a heart rate at which your heart is going when you're really bored. So if it's tonight, if you're going like that, one of the best things you can do, pitch yourself because it's going to help. And I'm going to tell you why in a sec. If your heart rate's like this before a game, night before a game, two hours before a game, do you think when the crows or the power run out there and they're really terrible in the first quarter and people go, oh, look at them, they're not fit enough, is that possible? No. The answer is if you've done this for two hours the night before and two hours before the game, you are exhausted. So this is one of the things about understanding this. And why did I say to pitch yourself? What are the two, what is the one drug, my drug of choice? The only drug I don't drink, don't take drugs, but there's one drug that I think is the most important drug if you want to be great at any sport. That's what A. What is it? Adrenaline. Adrenaline is our drug of choice. We need to control it. We need to know how to get the right amount and how to get rid of it. So that's what we're going to do, Jane. By the way, James Magnuson and the captain of the um, Brazilian soccer team only went over to this point, to this point, in the highest World Cup expert. They're experts, and it was the World Cup. And Magnuson said, I couldn't swim. I just felt really tired all the time. And because they're champions, a bit like me, I never went to an individual psych ever in my life. But when we had team psych things once at Sassy, I loved it. Because it was like, oh, yeah, well, what about this? And asking questions. Magnuson and some of those guys wouldn't go in because they'd go, no, I'm fine, I'm good. And sometimes people don't know it's going to hit them until the biggest game. And that could be your grand final. So. The opportunity you're being given today is to say, this is never going to hit me because now I know how to deal with it. And I'm going to ask the coaches to practice some of this stuff at training. So the most important thing in performance is this care. You must care about yourself. If you want to be great, care about yourself is two things. It means you take extra time to look after yourself, to make sure you do your preparation, to make sure if you want to be better than anyone else, go out and do extra stuff. About others means you check on your mates. You make sure they're okay. If they come to training and they're not drinking for a reason, maybe there's a reason that that's there. You don't go, oh, yeah, I have a few more. You actually start to listen to each other. And we are going to have random care days that you put on your calendar, which means people have to check on someone. And it doesn't have to be a teammate. It can be a mum. Ring them up. Check how they are. Because what I know is if I make you do that, when you need someone, it comes back to you. Does that make sense to everyone? We need to go both ways. And about the result, because you want to win. We are not here to lose. We are here to win. But all of those three things go together. And as I said, uh, there's another video. Sassy will say, that's the world and that's you. And then Sassy say, and this is what you can control. And everyone says, that's all you do. And I say, rubbish. You can control this much, but you've got to understand all of these concepts. And most people never get taught them. So you'll never be as great as you can be. So tonight, talent knowledge. First thing you need to know is, oh, actually, one. talent knowledge, all you need to know is if you were doing what you were doing last year, or if you're doing the same thing as you were doing last week, you're not getting better. So I have AFL guys come sit on my couch going, Jen, I've been drafted. Oh, I'm training every day. And then I say, is every other AFL player training every day? Oh, yeah. So how are you possibly getting an edge over them if you're only doing what they're doing? So we put things like have a rebounder at home. Do all of the things like that. Have a bit of fun with people. Go out. Uh, put cones out around the thing that, with fluoro colours in that you have to try and hit every now and then. So we get used to targets. So talent knowledge is a whole area on it, but I'm not, I'm not time too much tonight. This is another one, luck. You need to understand luck has determined so much of what's happened to you in life. Who's heard from someone, don't talk about luck, there's no such thing as luck. I guarantee people hear this all the time. It's crap, all right? It is wrong because guess what? How many people here are wanted put in an order before you were born for a penis? You can all be the Pope. I can't be the Pope, all right? 
You luck into lots of things. You luck into whether you're a male or a female. You luck into which country you're born into. You luck into who's really tall here. Put an idea before I put it. <laughs> All I'm saying is most of us didn't get to put in an order. Do we get that? Luck happens. You need to understand that sometimes you will be unlucky in things. If you've ever seen Monfrey's bounce a couple of years ago, there's been a few that bounce 90% that way. Guess what? Sometimes it's absolutely meant because they can do it. Other times in footy, who's been lucky in footy here? Hands up. Who's had a ball bounce, luckily for them? Who's had a ball bounce the other way? Yeah. Luck happens. So what we have to do is decide what is lucky and what we can influence about it. Um, by the way, I am born in the luckiest month of the year. What month am I born in that's the luckiest month of the year for sport? Close, I loved it. January. 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 I worked it out when I was 13. I'm lining up in athletics going, I'm killing everyone. Oh, yeah, that's right. They're all 12. I'm in the next year up because I was in January. So I started to be a thinker. When I talk about thinking, notice. Notice why you are better than someone else. Notice why someone is better than you. Before you go out, do every one of you look on the field to see what shoes your opposition's wearing. Because if they've got screw-ins versus molded, depending on how cold it, uh, how wet it is, if they have things like um, some will wear grass cats, if it's wet, dodge them. Start to understand everything you notice. Eddie, um, uh, sorry, um, Chris Rock is a comedian. He said, I notice everything and it's hell. I notice things. I spend time making you watch videos of ridiculously stupid Married at first sight and things like that. And people go, why would you do that? I want you to notice how people treat people. I want you to notice what people say versus what they mean. The more you notice about humans, the more you get to change what you do or what they do. And so we're going to go into the next one here, individual characteristics. In my book, or normally I have a whole series of things. This is what, this is the second time I went out with Lonsdale. We photocopied this. And these are all statements. They're true, false, or sometimes. From it, I can tell you which of these you already are and which of those you have to work on. Isn't that a nice thing? Wouldn't you like to know if you're in the middle or if you're up the end with some of the answers? Most people don't know. They just assume. Greatest people will be caring, bold, driven, colourful, prepared, imaginative, and resilient. We know that. So on he these things, it will have things like uh, people like me. Or I don't always follow the group. Ah, there's all questions there. And you go through and we put what is great, what you need to change. So one of the questions, and everyone can answer this while you're just sitting here. Um, hands on your head if you say true. Uh, hands on your hips if you say false. And uh, cross your arms if you say sometimes. And the answer is, uh, the question is, what do I want to ask you? Ah, the question is, I like being centre of attention. True, count your head, sometimes across your arm, not on your hips. Go on, make a decision. Here's the truth. People who are champions will generally say true to them. Some will say sometimes. So if you put sometimes, when does that sometimes have to be? <laughs> Don't know. When does that sometimes have to be? When you do something good. Lots of people say that to me. Not right. Not quite. You notice I don't go, wrong, bad answer, because that makes people not want to answer again. The same as not want to kick with their other side or not want to make a mistake so I won't go near the ball. You need an atmosphere where people have a shot, make a mistake and go again. Why should it be sometimes for some people? When is it? Ah, I love that. You've got to be Gary Ablett. Would he be a sometimes? Of course he is. What is sometimes is when I'm on the field, when I'm playing, not when I'm winning. When I am playing, I need you to notice me because I can make a difference in the game when I need to. When you are off the field, you can be my old man and Clark Kent. But when you hit the field, every time you have to feel like Superman. Superman is this big. Clark Kent is this big. All right? So you need to understand that's what we've got to be. If you say, no, I don't like to be, you are probably more likely to be a defender, one of the salt of the earth people, but I need you to know if you're Leo Barry and you need to take that last mark, yeah, I'm prepared to do it. 
I'm going to back myself. If you want to be in the biggest games, and this is what would have stopped some of you being drafted, because you don't know about this stuff yet. And it makes a difference with all of those areas. And again, I have things to work on for all of those things. If you're not, guess what? If you're not bold. Colourful, by the way, doesn't have to be wearing lots of colour all the time, which actually does help, by the way. It can actually have lots of hair. It can be having no hair. All of those could be colourful things. <laughs> all right? But they're things that make you stand out. Who wears something that if I went out and said, oh, my God, I'm about to watch training, I could go, oh, yeah, there he is. I can find him. Who could you say would be like that here? Who could I find at training or in a game without looking at your number? Snowy, absolutely. I know exactly who that would be. <laughs> and the standard guys with red hair. So I have people who walk in and go, I'm really embarrassed I've had red hair. And I've gone, thank God you've got red hair. You're not boring. You're not the middle of the thing. We need you to go embrace it and be fantastic with it. So again, we need you to start understanding confidence counts. And these make confidence. Um, these are these these guys. Oh, what else? If you're in your shell a little bit, I'll make you do ridiculous things. So if you come to me, you might have to go and do a hip hop class altogether. I bring the hip hop instructor out, and then everyone goes, "I can't do this. I'm embarrassed." Guess what? You learn to do that. You can play pretty easy. This is nowhere near as embarrassing as doing that. So we need to put you out of your zone so you get there. These guys, when I first showed this clip seven six years ago. Um, these guys gave all their money away that they made from this clip because they made it for fun as a group. But I showed this to Blackwood um, Golf Club and the old blokes told me I had no idea none of them would ever win anything. I'd now like to introduce you to the guys who have won a couple of green jackets and all of things like that. So, again, these blokes were prepared to be out. So. <laughs> Mother Watson, Ben Crane, if you love golf, these guys can play. Now the words say, swing them up and ring, make your mama proud. Talks about all things like that. Imagine standing up and doing this. You need something fun. I need to see something at some Ben Crane was told he was the most boring person by a psychologist and I love the fact that he went, well, bugger you, I'll show you how boring I am. And he does a whole series of things like that. So in other words, things that change. You need to work out how much your motivation is. So anyone that sits with me in a team sport, I said, what's your motivation for getting along out of 10? How much do you love having a great team, having fun, being with each other? And most team people will say 9 or 10 out of 10. If I get someone who says 1 or 2 and they're in a team sport, they're probably Jason Ackermanis. Now, people shouldn't pay him out. They needed to help him. So when he did, he is different. He thinks differently, but he's a champion because he is different. But when he did the handstands by himself, what would I have made him do to be more teamy? What would you make him do? So Jason likes being out there. That's fine. But how do we make him more teamy? Anyone got any ideas? What would you have done? Everyone. I would have gone, take two of your mates, and even better, get two kids over from the fence and all do it together every time. You know, like just take different people. So again, he starts to understand because at some point he's going to be a coach and if he doesn't get people by then, he won't be a very good coach either. So teaching him how to share and be share the spotlight. Being part of the spotlight is important, but sharing it is important too. Next one, getting along. How important is winning, trophies, sponsorship, being the best? If you want to be an elite athlete, you've got to give me a 9 or a 10. Because if you don't give me a 9 or a 10 as an elite athlete, someone else is going to be giving me a 9 or a 10. They'll make it. So again, in a team, I will tell you all of this stuff when I teach people what to do and all the things, if they don't do it, I say, I still love you. You're in the beast. 
I still care about people and want to make them better, but if they don't have the time to do the extra things so that they don't get better than someone else, the answer is that's why you have a B grade in a club. And they should be loved in there. They just don't generally work as hard. And the last one is making sense of the world. Tigger versus Eeyore. And I'm going to show you that now. Oh, no, I'll show you this just beforehand. Thank goodness. See, I hope you can hear it. Hey, I'm Dave with the Jelly Vision Lab. And today we're going to talk about changing behavior. If you're in charge of your company's training and safety, you're trying to get your employees to, I don't know, quit forklift jousting in the warehouse. Most of us are in the business of changing somebody else's behavior. But changing somebody else's behavior oh, is a really right. hard thing to do. Luckily, a lot of very smart people have spent a lot of time studying behavior change, and one of those very smart people is B.J. Fogg. B.J. Fogg founded the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University, and he found that it takes three things to get somebody to change their behavior. One, motivation. Somebody has to actually want to make the behavior change. Two, Trigger. There has to be some sort of event or piece of communication that triggers the person to make the change in that moment. And three, ability. Making the behavior change actually has to be easy enough to accomplish. What most of us focus on is the trigger and motivation. We know that we can write an email or structure a display ad campaign or hang up a poster in the break room. And what most of those triggers are about is motivation. It's convincing somebody that they need or want to make that behavior change. What most of us don't focus on is ability, is making it easy to actually make that behavior change. See, that's what I love because that's called coaching. That's called making you better because most players want to get better. Most people, if they do something wrong, don't want to do that. And it's a trigger to go, yeah, I need to do, I need to be better. But the truth is, unless we make it easy enough, we break down rules, we put things out there, no amount of showing people what they do wrong makes them better. So all of a sudden now, this is where the art of coaching comes in. How do we make people better? How do we make it easy enough to help people to get better? And this guy here, um, let me go. This is um, 10,000 hours. I haven't got time. Usually I would play Macklemore. Um, singing 10,000 Hours about all of that. It's a great song. Uh, this is Dan. He plays golf with Jimmy, who's my golfer. Dan convinced Nike, because he was an accountant who never played golf, to let him start from zero and do 10,000 Hours. He's up to about eight and a half, nine thousand 9,000 now. He's on a handicap of less than one. He's doing really well. But the big problem is that Dan, we've now found that golf is 17,640 hours because you can play for so much longer than you can for footy. So poor old Dan's only about halfway there, but he's already in the top 1% of the world on handicaps. You guys, the other thing I want you to understand is everyone who talks to you, people say they're experts. People go, I do psychology. To be a psychologist, you have to do six years, you have to have a master's, and I'm not allowed to run around and tell you who I work with. That's, that's unethical. And yet you can get other people who have done one unit of psychology that come in and go, I do leadership and I do this and I'll show you that. Make sure you get an expert. If you want to be great, get a better person to help you. Coaches need to find the best mentors to fast track. So in other words, to be an expert, you should have done about 10,000 hours of coaching as well. So if you've got a brand new coach, an L plate coach, look at AFL. L plate coaches, the players who are drafted into their teams, tend to be delisted a lot quicker than people who are with uh, coaches who are experts. So start to look at this. Do me a favour, watch the AFL and go, oh, wow, I never knew that. I never looked at all of this. And start looking at the difference. This is something I want to tell you about, is thinking style. Because I've come here tonight to talk to you about how are you going to be great on the field, how are you going to help each other stay in that zone. You need to understand, on the outside, everyone thinks people look like this. In football clubs, everyone thinks people are tough, strong, all of that stuff. But on the inside, people are two things. They're Tiggers or they're Eeyores. On the inside, people are either someone who is an extrovert, likes hands on heads. We like to be noticed. All right? Others will be quite quiet and nice. They are both brilliant players, but they think differently. Now, important for you to know this stuff. Whether you are a Tigger or Eeyore, depends on lots of stuff that has happened to you. So in other words, I'm a tigger. Why am I a tigger? I had a mum who told me the golf hole was this big. 
would actually, every time something would go wrong, we'd go, that's okay, Jenny. I remember being 5 nil down at tennis and her going, I remember when I was 5 nil down and I did this and I did this and I came back and I won 6-5. It makes you resilient because you get told all the time you can, what you can do. Come on. But you don't get just left, oh, it'll be all right. No, do some more work. You'll be good at that. Make sure you're a bit of a tigger. Eeyores tend to be great people, but they're the ones that doubt themselves more. And that can actually happen from being criticised a lot when you're a kid. It can be happen from being told all the time that things were wrong. So you tend to blame yourself. And there's a whole book that I brought with me today, which is on um, all the latest research on why forgiving yourself and making mistakes is the most important thing in having a healthy, happy, successful life. So again, Tiggers and Eeyores, what you think determines how you feel. How you feel determines how you behave. So on a field you go, oh yeah, I'm feeling really good. It's a good day today. So you get to the game early, you're bouncing, you're ready to go, behaviors on the field, calling for the ball, all of that. What about you think, oh shit, I have to stay behind and do this thing with Jenny tonight. Oh, emotions, oh, how bad is that? Behaviors, people yawn, they don't want to be there. That can happen too. So we know as psychologists, we can actually take any of those areas and change it to make you feel better. And it's, is it written on this slide or not? No, let me see. Go that one. It's called cognitive behavioral, and the stupid thing is stupid idiot psychologists called it therapy. Men do not do therapy. So I call it cognitive behavioral training. And men do training. Is that you're right? We've all done training tonight. So we're going to do some training. So the first idea is I have to show you that our heads can do some amazing things. So let's see, first of all, who is really imaginative. You're going to give me a chance here. If you don't do it, I don't care. But if you want to try it, you're going to find something. First of all, imagine you got a lemon in your left hand for me. Hold it. Hold the lemon in your left hand. Again, I will never make anyone do things. If you want to be great, try it. Hold the lemon, feel, look at it, see what it looks like. What colour is it? What colour is it? Yellow. Yellow? How's it feel? Oh, yes. Firm? Squishy? It's squishy? <laughs> <laughs> it's squishy? Okay, put it down on the desk, cut it in half for me. Cut it in half. Pick it up and smell it. Smell the lemon. Some of you might have just had something like it on your steak, who knows? Put it down, Put it. cut it into quarters. Pick up your lemon for me. It's juicy. It's yellow, it's right in front of you, and it's really, really sour. I want you to open your mouth, and I want you to bite down on that sourest lemon that you have ever bitten on. It is really, really, really sour. And I want you to just hold it in there, hold it in there. Now, is there anyone in here that can make their mouth water doing that? Yeah, a few people can. I was terrible at this when I first started doing it, because I'm not highly imaginative. I can now just say the word lemon and make my mouth water. Now, why is this important? Because in 1989, I was playing lacrosse in the World Cup on the WACA. And for the first time ever, I went over. I am someone that's in the zone all the time and thinking. And all of a sudden, I noticed something about myself. I had a dry mouth. I went, this is really weird. I've got a dry mouth. What's wrong with me? I've never got a dry mouth. And I noticed I'm one of the best talkers on a field. And I'm going... This is hard to talk. Oh, I'm finding this really difficult. And then I know I'm starting to feel a little, ah. Uh, and I'm going, okay, what am I going to do about it? So what did I do? I went over and I found um, at that stage some Coke, can of Coke, and just swirled it around in my mouth. And then I can't remember. I drank it or spat it out. And then I said to my teammate, first of all, let's have a few little throws before we go out there. Not a big one. First throw on the ground. Do not throw me a 50-meter pass over my shoulder running full belt. Let's just have a nice, so we waxed. One of us got the ball, we just gave each other a nice, easy throw. What happens is, by doing that, I've actually told my brain, when you are, have a dry mouth, it's because your brain has actually taken away the adrenal gland, have actually soaked up all the spit. By putting the Coke or something fizzy in your mouth, it's actually telling your brain you're feeling better. So anyone who throws up before a game, I want you to get something fizzy. I don't care if it's a sour lollies or anything like that. Put it in your mouth. If you hate flying, when you get on the plane, put sour, you know, those really bad sours in your mouth. Because what it does is it will start to give your brain something else to process and it actually makes you feel better. Our brain does amazing things. I told Erin Phillips this five, six years ago. And the other thing we used to do before a game was we made a chocolate, but you could do red frogs as well. And we would get a uh, block of chocolate and before a game we'd go, as you eat this piece, you are, you're a god. You're a god. And we'd all have one little piece of chocolate out and we'd all tell each other we were gods. 
placebo. But God, it makes you feel good when you're sharing that. And as we go out, we're going to be doing this. So I told her on that. So in her two matches, that uh, two teams that she won, um, and I only know this at my book launch, she started up and she said, Jenny taught me before a game, you need to drink about just near a, a little bit of Coke and then you need to have a chocolate bar. And I'm like, I don't remember actually saying that, but she did it with her teams and they all shared it and they won both times and the coaches thought they were weird. But again, we know the things... Our brain is nervous. Who throws up here? Anyone throw up before games? If anyone gets dry mouth or throw up, do me a favour. Have some lemon stuff. But if you get to be, you haven't got anything, but you get to be really visual, you can even make your mouth water. It tells your body you are less anxious. So, next thing to go along with that. Here's me. I'm a tigger. One important event. This says, I'll read it out to you. One important event. Thoughts. I played well. I know I can. I'm really capable. Emotions, excitement, confident and pride. And afterwards, behaviours. Walk tall, I might be humble. Some are arrogant, joy, celebration. And as I said, I don't drink, but after a big win, you will see me doing one of two things, sitting on a chair going, ah, or going, jump, 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 and everyone thinks I'm the drunkest person on the dance floor. Because it's one of the two things. It's excitement and that. So that's how tickets think. Need to an important game. I will play well. I know I can. I'm very capable. Excitement, anticipation. And before a game, want the attention. Walk tall. I can talk and I have good butterflies. That's how you have to go on to a field feeling. Now, remember, Eeyores are equally good players. But when they start to doubt themselves, this is how Eeyores think. One important game. Eeyores think, up here, my opponent wasn't very good today. I was lucky I only made so many mistakes. I only made so many mistakes. Do we hear Tiggers talking about mistakes? Nah. Tiggers let them go. Ah. Relief, pride, maybe a bit guilty because they remember the mistakes. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't have let that bloke do that. Got to run me that one time. Is that sometimes your thoughts? Is that sometimes slow, like, um, analysing your, your game mode as well? Like, it might be, but I'm telling you, I want, and I'll show you what I want you to do in a minute, all right? But this is the difference, and this is why I'm just describing this, and I'm going to give you why. Walk a little taller, but some Eeyores will celebrate to feel better about themselves. They will have so much of an analysis of their game going on and they're worrying about the mistakes they had that they actually drink to shut the voice up in their head. All right? Really important that you actually get this. Then need to an important game. I hope I play well. I don't want to make too many mistakes. My opponent looks strong. Oh, I hope my opponent has a bad day. Fear, dread, helplessness, embarrassment, looks small, hides on a field, can't talk, heart racing, dry mouth, nervous number ones, nervous number twos, throwing up. Now, when I played sport, I thought everyone was a tigger like me. I didn't know this existed. I thought everyone went onto a field going, yay, great big day, let's play really well. And now I know this actually occurs, but I also know some of our best players with this and the way you coach them will either make them on game day be better or be worse. Really important. Now, here's the best thing. Tiggers lost an important game. I played okay. We played, we had an off day. Conditions didn't suit us. We'll win next time. What Tiggers do, as do Tigers, and the reason I'll put Tiger here, Tiggers without empathy are Tigers. They will be your alpha males who will tell everyone off. They can bite and destroy every Eeyore in your club and they don't know it. They don't realise it because the Eeyores will never tell them. All right? Now, what you don't know about Tiggers is, and Tigers, we make excuses and tell everyone else not to do it. I'm letting you into the world of how we think. Things don't go right, we'll come up with an excuse. Now, that is actually not such a bad thing, as long as it goes with something else. And on here it will say, Keep your star big. And what does it say underneath? Keep your star big. One excuse, two new plans. One excuse, two new plans. One excuse to keep your star big, two new plans, so you don't do the same stupid thing again. Does that make sense? It's called regression to the mean. If you do the same thing again, you'll get the same result. But if you go, okay, excuse. Now, I'll give you an example. I'm playing golf with my lovely husband and my brother, Mark Williams. And I'm playing pretty good golf. So what do they do? As soon as I'm about to hit, they stand behind me and go, ah! 
done. Then it goes over there. So what did I say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, that was about right, actually. Most people say, oh, you terrible people. Yeah, it was something worse than, bloody idiots, what are you doing? And, of course, it went over there. And I've gone, oh, that was all your fault to Mark. And Mark Williams goes, you and your bloody excuses. I live everything I talk about. My excuse. So if I said, no, it was me, I'm terrible, you, may, you can put me off any time you want, as I walk over to my board, what's happening to my staff? It's getting smaller, isn't it? It's all my fault. I'm terrible. I can't play. Next time I go to hit it, am I going to be better or worse? Worse, because I'm smaller. So, one excuse, you bloody idiots, your fault. Ah, over there, two new plans. Turn my visor so I can't see them. And then in my head I think, da 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 bubble Watson. And it goes straight down the middle. And I go, yes. All right, one excuse, two new plans. So, if you fumble the ball, excuse, it doesn't matter what it is. Just be kind to yourself. Two new plans. Next time, get down more. Next time, watch the ball better. Say my ball. Do you understand that? So instead of actually taking it on like, I was terrible, what if I do the same thing again? Well, you're ruminating over your mistake. We need to go, ah, what are the two new plans? Easy done, isn't it? You get better. What if you and, make the same mistake again? Ah, you make another. You make new plans again. If you make the same mistake again, what do we say about ability? So let's say... You pick the ball up poorly every twice, three times in a row. And you keep doing new plans. I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to do this. The answer might be, I need you to do, at training, we're going to do three more of those and we're going to do this, but I'm going to get someone to hit you with a bag because at training, you don't have enough pressure on you. Or do you do your centering breath before you go onto the ground? And we'll find out what that is in a minute. Do you do that to calm down? Oh, shit, I haven't done that yet. Well, you need to do that. So your new plans, and that's the art of captaincy. That's the art of this. Like I have actually said to a girl in goals, what do you think you're doing? Come on, Fiona, get on the post. Okay, and so Fiona goes, okay, I'm now on the post. What am I doing there? I've now got a new plan, all right? So, again, this is one of the things of understanding this makes you better all the time. So all of my athletes, elite, the most elite, go with this one excuse, two new plans. Excuse can be anything. So I had a young girl in place across the other day and I said something and she goes, Oh, but what about this and this? And it was the biggest excuse I had. I'm now a coach. I go, good excuse. Now we're going to do this and this. How about this? She goes, yeah, I can do that. All right, because she's a bouncer. And what we know is the biggest thing about compassion in life is when you make a mistake, forgive. You've got to forgive yourself because if you keep getting stuck into yourself, you get smaller and smaller. And, oh, here's the next thing. On a field, do you have the conversation beforehand, all of you, you're the captain. I'm the captain or the coach. I have a conversation that on game day, I'm going to be directive. I'm going to say, get on your player. Get closer. You're allowed to say that to each other. Do this. You know, like, get there. I haven't got time to say, how's your mum? How's your dad? Hope you had a nice day at work today. Oh, yeah, that's really good. On a field, we are there to be directive and get people to move quickly. Does that make sense? I actually said to one girl one day, you, you weigh more than that one. You're getting beaten at the moment. Switch over. And then we won the grand final. One girl goes, did you just call me fat out there? And we were all laughing. We get on so well off the field. If someone hasn't done something well, you need to say, ah, we need to improve this. Oh, how's your mum? How's your dad? Good job. So another bit is Mark will tell you the first time we played touch footy together. He's there. He wasn't covering where he needed to be, so I just shoved him. So it's all really good for relationships if women shove blokes, you know, move. And afterwards, I went, that was really good. Next thing is, as a captain, if you tell someone, come on, you need to get closer or you need to get better, what you need to do then is when they do something, well, what do you think is the first thing you need to say? Nice. Good job, good job, good job. Go harder. Get closer. Getting better. <coughs> getting better. So the whole time is you are making someone feel like I am working hard. And as the individual, that means you listen, you go, and you can actually say that to them. Who has heard he sure might duck? <laughs> he's sure when he is in the zone is brilliant he talks he says good things when he goes outside the zone remember when we talked about the flow zone when he sure goes outside the flow zone he is a bloody idiot the way he talks to people notice can you please notice when that sort of thing happens and start to go oh yeah listen he's giving good feedback he's giving instructions he's telling someone he's who's patted someone on the ass here tonight Oh, you really need to. That's the next thing as a captain or as a coach. When someone is feeling like an Eeyore, you need to go, 
Hey, mate, I need you to do this. Or touch when you give the instruction. You know why? Because touch makes people attend. So before a game, you know, when they give 30 instructions out and people who are Eeyores are going, oh, shit, what about the game? They don't remember it. Has anyone ever had to have a dentist appointment or something and you forget where you put your car keys? When you are anxious, you forget stuff. So the biggest thing is before a game, if you go out there anxiety and you get all these instructions, it's not that you don't mean to. Who's a runner in here? Any runner in here? If there's a runner, sometimes, you know when the coaches, like Rodney E, go, on the phone and the runner gets there and gets, yeah, 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 yeah. Guess what? The runner forgets what they're supposed to say by the time they get out there. And remember there was the one instance in the Gold Coast where the guy said, the runner didn't tell me that? And a player got suspended. It was last year. It happened. And I'm sitting there going, this is quite possible because runners forget too. So these guys, conditions in the they intense, defensive, oh, hate losing, maybe embarrassed, maybe agitated and angry. And so again, Mark Williams used to have the rule. And Mark and I got on the bus one year and I started talking. And everyone just looked at me. You're talking, Jen. I'm a talker. So if I lose, I want to bitch about things. I want to actually talk. And Mark used to have a rule that everyone had to be quiet on the bus because he liked being quiet. Doesn't really work very well for talkers because we need to get, all of us need to get better. So he was prepared to change that and go, oh yeah, all right, if you feel like you need to win, go to the back of the bus, if you want to be sitting quiet, front of the bus. But the whole idea is don't make everyone, it's one size doesn't fit all in a footy club. And so these guys, Next time, we'll get them today. I am so much better prepared than I was last time because I've done my two new plans. Two new plans. And as a captain, off the field, start asking people, what have you done differently this week? Ah, oh, weren't too good at that. And if they don't know how to get better, your job is to come up with a drill to get them better. They were lucky last game. They stick it out the media and they're bad. Eeyores, watch this. This is really important. Eeyores, lost an important game. My opponent is too good for me. I made so many mistakes, no one thinks I can play. This happens to kids, especially teenagers. Lots of people start thinking about this in their own heads. People think they can't play. Guilt, anger at themselves, and the worst thing is despondency. That means I can't influence this. I'm just terrible and life's pretty hard. In doing so, they withdraw, they lose all self-confidence, they only see or hear about mistakes. And that's the problem when, if you're captaining or coaching one of these people, you might even be saying good job, but if in their head all they're doing is giving themselves negative messages, it stays with them. And they don't even hear the good stuff and parents will often say, what happened? I'm telling you AFL guys that get taken away from home and put in houses with tragics, their supporters who tend to look after young AFL guys, who all they do is talk about football and how they're going. We'll even say netballers, we've got some here now, who have taken away from another country, brought out here. They have no um, support. They have no one talking to them about how's your day otherwise. Everything's about the sport and it starts to make them feel really, really bad. And they drink or take drugs to actually feel better about themselves. And that gives you sick, low emotion and that happening all the time. And for me, being in a talk to young group of young men is really important because the more you learn about this, the more you can actually say, this is normal for a lot of people. I can be better than this. I can get some help and we can do some things as a club. Need to win? Ah, my opponent's too good. I don't want to make too many mistakes. What if we lose a game? All of that. And back to the fear, dread and helplessness. Biggest thing here is if you do open and honest feedback in front of someone. I'll give you an example. I'm a tigger. You tell me what I did wrong in the game. Make something up. Can you play? Hey. Can you play? Can I play? You are, do I think you can play? Oh, the cross. No. <laughs> just do I think you can play? I'm just saying in a club, if, you, if I say give me some feedback, just say I did something poorly on field, tell me what it was, open and honest feedback. Shit kick. Okay. He's come out and he's shown me on Monday, you know, which is a long time afterwards. It's a bit like telling the dog not to poo in the corner two days later. It doesn't actually work very well. Better off to do some better drills to improve people. But if you tell me, oh, Jenny, you're doing shit kick, I will look at you and go, does this guy, is he an expert? No, he's played three minutes. He's not very good. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. And in my head, I'm just going, don't take any bloody notice of him. I'm a tigger. He's, I'll be all right. I'll be fine. I'll get out there again. Now, let's say you're an Eeyore. How do you feel about giving someone, maybe I'm a tiger, I'll get you back. How do you feel about giving me feedback? 
you don't want to. And you're making something up to try and make it that I'm not going to get shitty at you. All right? It happens. Let's put it the other way around. I'm a tiger and I'm giving you feedback. I'm prepared to cr I want to get stuck into you. Mate, you did this wrong and you did this wrong. You need to be better. Now, if you're already beating yourself up like that, how do you reckon that goes? It just flattens everything. It flattens everything. If I'm a tigger, I'm trying to actually go, I want to give you some feedback, but I really don't want to do it this way. And how about I say, oh, maybe some of your kicks weren't too good, but we'll go out and we'll, we'll actually have a few more kicks ourselves. So again, how you give it, how you receive it, and whether you're actually experts. And this is one of the hard things for coaches because coaches, often if you're emotional during the game, you can't even think. So you're giving feedback on what you remember and what you remember isn't actually not often what actually is happening. And so young men giving each other feedback in a game sometimes is totally from what they remember in the last two seconds or things like that. I had um, a nephew who, unfortunately for the coaches, got told he wasn't doing this well. And I said, well, let's watch your tape. He was actually really quite good at it. So I said, you need to sit down with the coach and show him your tape. And afterwards they said, well, he might have been right, but that's very arrogant doing it. And I'm going, well, there's no winning in that situation. I want you to watch your tapes. I want you to have a look. And if you can't do something well, find someone to help you make you better. But you need to understand this is really important in how people think. So this is my thing that I do about the, what colours you are and everything else like that. Improvement. One excuse keeps your confidence. Two new plans helps you get better. You need to actually start talking that way. But it also needs a drill to go with it. Self-compassion, unlike making people soft, as long as they've got the two new plans, makes people better. It actually gives people more motivation. If I say to you, hey, mate, maybe your kicking's not that good, but we'll go out and do something together with it. All right, you're more likely to go, yeah, I can. And they did a study where they said three different things. We played a team and we were terrible. And it was an actually a different study. It was on a really hard test. But let's say we played a team and we were really bad. And I say afterwards going, it's okay, they're a really good team. They're a really good team. That was really hard. I made that way too hard for you this week. All right? Second group, they said, you're all Brighton. You should be great. You're all A grade. You should be better. Let's see how we go. And the third one, they didn't say anything. And then they looked at how hard people trained the next week. The people we said, that was really hard, don't worry about it, come on, we're going to come up with some new drills, were more likely to go out to training, be there early and that, than even the ones who were told how great they were and they should be working harder. Because after a while, it's your self-motivation and being a little kind to yourself gets you out there again. So, things I want you to do, there's a whole other area of monitoring, evaluating and planning. So I would expect you before games, you need to notice things about your opponent, about yourself. Who's videoed themselves? Who watches themselves? Who gets one of their family to video them sometimes? Want to be great? Start looking at that. Do it a little bit of yourself. What goes on? Watch, video, find experts, set targets. You've got old blokes often at the club. I don't want, I want the old blokes to be involved. I want them to feel great about coming out and helping you. Ask someone who's over 50 to help you and they will love doing that. But one thing is tell them not to be negative. Tell them how your job's to help me get better. So if you think my kicking's not great, don't keep telling me my kicking's not great. Tell me how we come out and help me have a few extra kicks. All right? This is how we get things. The one excuse, two new plans. We're going to get you to that concept of flow. I need you to be in that middle area. So first of all, we're going to link head and heart. We're going to link these two together. Thinking, warm up. Warm up. We need to actually make sure that you love warm up. Now, if you are actually, imagine you're hating or you're anxious. How, if you're angry, how's your muscles feeling? Tense. If you're anxious, how's your muscles feeling? Same thing, tense, shaky, all of that. So you can do this hugely big warm up, and if you are tense, guess what? You'll hurt yourself. You can be me and be 10 minutes beforehand dancing around or something and go out there and go, I'm ready. If your head's rare, it's ready to go, and you feel like you're a god, you are ready to play. Would that be right? This is your job before a game. You need some fun stuff. You need to connect some music with that. Notice, notice. What do you notice about yourself before games? Start writing down every game. Oh, what do I feel like? How does it go? Um, this guy goes from being... Oh, in the zone. The umpire is fantastic. When umpires are in the zone, they make really good decisions. Yeah, 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 yeah
Hey, David, so I'm going to try and don't get celebration for him and every time the Lakers play, this time it was Detroit. So it's a big game. This was the biggest yeah, rivalry in the league back then. For scalping tickets for six hundred dollars. And of course Mickey's crew does the game. And look at his body language. There's thousands of miles from her. It's miserable. He's a tone bug. Don't you miss that last car? Here. You want to buy these? No way you make a job. Has anyone ever seen the biathlon or know what it is? What is it? Uh, the skiing and shooting. Excellent. Skiing and shooting. So, skiing. How's your heart rate? How's your heart rate skiing? Oh. Cross country. Hi. Get used to me doing things like this and understanding this. Who's got a heart rate monitor on? Who owns one? You need to own one. If you want to be great in life, own a heart rate monitor and use it. Again, most of them sit in things. But Skiing, it's like this, cross country. Shooting, what's your heart rate like? It should be really low. So Olympic people need to get it from high to low. I coached a golf guy and I started teaching him this. And he went, my dad was in the Olympic biathlon team for, South, for Australia. And I'm like, so why don't you do this? And he goes, because that's the biathlon. And again, people don't connect that it works for everything. So I'm going to ask you to sit back nice and easy and I'm going to do this breath for you and I want you to take it in and it's one long one hold for two and then out nice and easy let's have a go at it and in two three four five six hold two out two three four five six seven long breath all right do it again one more time ready and in two Three, four, five, six, hold, two, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, we're going to use that and we use numbers on purpose. Why do I use a number? Because of the following. I want you to think of something you don't like about yourself. I promise I will not ask. Something you don't like about yourself or you've done wrong. Now I'm going to give you six numbers and I want you to add them up and get them right. So here we go, addition, 6 plus 4 plus 5 plus 5 plus 7 plus 3. What do we get? 30. How'd you go at thinking what was wrong with yourself? Most of you wouldn't be able to because what we do is if we give the brain something else to do, it stops being anxious. It stops worrying about things. So I want you to imagine as we're doing this now, you are breathing in a nice, calm colour. What's a calm colour? 
blue, blue, green, people like that. And when you're breathing out, you are breathing out the nice, angry, anxious colours, which could be red, someone said purple, again, whatever you like like that. So imagine it. I want you to imagine yourself, those numbers coming in. Because when you're going to do this, you are going to do it for yourself. You'll be counting. So see the numbers as you're doing it. Let's have a go. And ready? With colours this time. In, two, three, four, five, six. Hold, two, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am expecting anyone who practices this, I would normally, if you get one of my books or come to one of my sessions, you would get homework with this, which will tell you to practice how many times. But to go along with that, I need you to repeat it to you really good. But remember, we're starting off ability, making it easy, all by itself. Now, your heart doesn't know if it's doing this because it's running, it's anxious, or it's sitting next to someone really cute, right? Your heart has no values whatsoever. It just beats. Your head does all the other stuff. So now what we need to do is get your use your heart rate by taking it up. So in other words, coaches, I want you to actually run your team around the field or people who are training them, run them. Get it high, then what do I want you to do? Bring it down quickly. Because this is practicing being anxious before a game. This is practicing any time in your life when you are getting shitty, when you are doing road rage in the car, anything like that, and you notice. Notice. What do you notice when you start to get angry? Hot. Yeah, you might shake. You might be tense. When you start to notice that, you are to then start doing this, and you see the colours and you do that. But we need to practice getting our heart rates up first. So that means go for a run. Do anything you like. Right at the moment, ready? Up you go, up and down. 10 times in it, 20 times in your chair. Go, quick, go, up and down, 20 times. Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Could be a quads. <laughs> you should see this when I do it with like a whole group of women who have never acted. Oh, quads. The nurses, I had this. Okay, that'll do. You put your heart rate up. Ready? We're going to now do a centering breath. Ready? And in, two, three, four, five, Six, hold, two, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, if you have gone for a big run, you'll find it's in, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. Now, some people just say do a long, slow breath. I want you to do the numbers because it gets your head where I need it to be. That makes sense? And this takes practice. So next time, not only do you practice it, I want you to compete with someone else. Know what your resting heart rate is and go for a run and it's the first one to get it back down to where they started. So you're actually competing being calm. <coughs> the night before, I would like you to go to sleep. I would like you to see the game. I would like to see yourself playing. I'd like you to see yourself in nice, easy motion. Slow it down. Get your heart rate up a bit by just imagining yourself playing. Then I want you to do the centering breath. Nice and calm. Before you hit a field, every time I want you to do that so you're calm. Coaches, if they're talking to you and you are really nervous, feel free to do that. Go and ask the coach, can you touch me and tell me two things before a game? My job is to actually make sure that you hit the field feeling like I'm relaxed, I'm ready to go, I'm looking like that. So again, with all of this, it's up to you to know about your heart rate zones. When do you play really well? And if it's too high up, bring it down. If you're angry, bring it down. You need to have strength put on your walls. In your change rooms, you are what you see. Anyone see Will Smith in, um, I think it's on this next one. Uh, what was this called? Focus. Focus. How did you do that? You want to say, legendary gambler. He bets on everything, anything. Huge cash bets all the time. Once the Bellagio put Bill Gates out of the high roller suite because Lee Wan was flying in. He was the perfect fit. But how did you know who he was going to pick? He told him to. He's been telling him all day. From the moment he left his hotel room, we've been priming him, programming his subconscious. He's been seeing the number 55 all day long in the elevator, in the lobby, even a stick pen on the doormat. Not only that, he loaded his route from the hotel to the stadium. He looks out the window, climbers are everywhere. Now he doesn't see it, 
but he dies. There's no getting around it. He even sees God. Suggestions are everywhere. And the number of flowers in the face. Wow, that is genius. Yeah, and it's not only what he sees, it's what he hears. The Mandarin word for five is Wu. There are 124 Wu Wu's in sympathy for the devil. Now he's not registering it, but it's all there. So when he picks up those binoculars, looks out on the field, sees a familiar face with the number 55 on his jersey, some little voice in the back of his mind says, that's it. And he thinks it's intuition, and he picks. What you see determines, and what you hear determines so much of what goes on in your life. And most people don't even know that. That's why advertising works. That's why they have all of this. So, around change rooms, around your room at home, relaxed, calm, feeling strong, good looking, whatever you want to put around, you got to feel like you are ready to play. And so, these are all the sort of things that need to be there. I'm going to show you that later on. That's a highlight tape. I need you to learn to understand. That if you are going to play well or you're not feeling good, go back to times that you felt great. Who knows how to use Windows Movie Maker or iMovie? If you don't know, these are the sort of things that are all the things that give you an edge that as a club, putting together halfway through the season, I'll come back and I'll help people who want to learn how to do this. Um, as a club, you need to do this because this is what makes people see themselves and see what they can do. When they start to doubt themselves, you're going to remember what you felt like when you were really good instead of actually waiting for it to, oh, it might happen again. No, you need to take some responsibility. Go and find a bit of tape. Have a bit of a picture of you with the under 10 trophy. This one, this one. And as you put it together, you start to watch yourself and you remember all the good things you can do. So that counts with a, and again, music, the music you're going to hear. You need to start big, not small. Um, I put this up at an AFL coaching conference when I did that this year. If you're a coach and you have big stars, they're feeling great, physically prepared, in the zone, confident, feeling valued. They have fun with really hard work. And they're big stars. This side, feeling stressed, maybe prepared physically, but over that adjustment level. Lack of confidence, feeling undervalued, always feels like everything's hard work. If you put 18 of these onto a field, you will be 18 of these. So again, you need to start understanding all of that. Um, this is Richmond. I showed my brother this one day and I said, this is why people don't get Richmond. When they are playing a game at about that level, most of their team have skills and competencies that are in the zone. The red ones, by the way, are the captains, are their leadership group. So they're an underdog or it's a normal round, they're in the zone, they're playing pretty well, underdog especially. Then all of a sudden, uh-oh, then our expectation is high, they're supposed to win, or it's finals, so many of theirs would go over the top, especially their leaders, and once they're over the top, they don't think, they react, they cannot influence the scoreboard, and all of a sudden they're not in the game, anywhere near as much. So, um, that's another one I won't show you now, but that's does it make someone a better player? I'll show you the first 10 seconds. Noel has six of his own. This guy made a foul, that was his foul, he let someone go past. And Goodwin, they're doing an excellent job, continue to attack the glass. You make you start bigger to put him back on? Sean Woods not happy with the way his guard came back over to the bench. Now remember, if a coach is a tiger, they might get a spray back. If the player's one, they might actually get something back. Now have a look. Him, is it going to make him any better? But my question is, is it making him any better? Or is it making well, him any better? And what do you notice they do? They start sitting there going, oh, I'm not going to say anything. I don't really want to go on, because if I make a mistake, that might happen to me. He said something to him, but he's not going to say anything. Again, all you need to know as a captain, as a coach, or as a player, is it making me better or not? So if he did the wrong thing, go and tell him, ask him to get, what are you going to do differently? What's he going to do? So, great coaches give good quality feedback, give good quantity of feedback. 
They deliver at will. They touch. They individualize it. And last of all, they inspire people to get better. Again, I put that on there. On the field, feedback. As I said, I want you to get understand it's direct. You can say, get on your plate. Get closer. Get closer, you dickhead. doesn't go down the same way. All right? I don't care how friendly you are. Do not belittle anyone. You will start, some of your team will disappear. Information feedback, yeah. Tell someone exactly what you need them to do. Up there, jump up. Go straight through for harder. You think that was hard? I reckon you got another 10% in you. Do you see how I say it versus that was weak? I reckon you got another 10 You can do better than that. Come on, get there. Remember the good things. Well done. Care off the field and know about your teammates who needs a bit of a hand. Pre-game plans, game day. Make your team big. Not everyone is the same. Now music leads to heart rate. Who listens to music on the way to, to and getting to a game? Yeah, now, if you listen to music that's screamo or anything that sends you over the top, that's what will happen. You need to listen to music that will put your heart rate in about the dancing zone. You know, if you don't dance, start to think about what it feels like because that is charisma. Movement to music. Who moves to music if we put music on in here? Who would be the one? People who are charismatic can't help but do this when they actually hear music. Again, I need you to go, what song? By the way, if you lose... No songs that are, if you're feeling miserable, no songs that tell you how bad you are. You need to listen to things that actually make you feel better. Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack is magnificent. Remember the Titan soundtrack. Have soundtracks that actually make you go, yeah, I can do this. Have you all seen Guardians of the Galaxy together? If you have no shared experiences off the field that are stupid, you don't have enough things to laugh about together. So if I said to my husband, we were coming here and I made a plan. What would you say, darling? Uh, how much of a plan? How much of a plan? Oh, about 90% of a plan. That's not a plan. So again, when you watch silly things together or go and do fun things together, you can share stuff that makes it funny on a field. So in other words, we were talking to someone the other day and then Guardians of the Galaxy at one stage, they start and they're talking to someone and the guy pulls the spaceship up and he goes, attention, idiots. And I was actually saying, I was really annoyed at talking to um, a person the other day. Mark goes, all you need to say is, attention, idiots. And we were laughing about it. If you are really feeling under the pump from someone, I call bad people who hurt people assholes. So I have sometimes players who are doing this while they're getting screamed at. Because it makes them feel better knowing that, okay, it's just an asshole speaking to me. I'll be right. I'll be... You need to keep your self-confidence. If people are treating you badly, they are not helping your life. All right, so all of this goes together. So, ah, talking, notice, pair up. Pair up. Who here pairs up before a game? Why would I suggest some of you start to pair up? Why would I pair up with you before a game? I like that, motivation. Um, if you are someone who might get a bit angry, if we're paired up, I need to actually know what are, first of all, your triggers. We need to trust each other. All right? If I notice you saying or get someone getting stuck into you all the time, I might go, mate, you're off for three minutes. Go. All right? So you need to pair up with trust. What you're going to do as far as that goes. Other thing you can pair up with, you want an extra kick or two? Pair up with me, mate. You get the ball, I'm coming past. Think about how many people get extra kicks because they do things like that. Again, you need to actually work out when you're out there, if you're not on, you need to trust someone to say, okay, come now, do this. When you were kicking for goal, I take it you all target acquisition. You don't kick between the goals, do you? Do you? No, you actually <laughs> need to pick a target. It's why golfers don't pick. Oh, there, they hit to a spot. All right? So we know target acquisition with our brains when we actually kick to someone. So Johnny Wilkinson, who used to play for England, he used to do this. And then on top of the goal, uh, the goalpost was a woman my age named Doris who one day was behind training and he kicked it to her. So he then imagined she would be sitting up on the uprights all the time and he'd kick it to her. So again, if you're practicing, again, these are skill acquisition things. Get a fluoro thing and put it behind the goal and actually kick to them. So you get really good at that. You imagine where you're going to do this. Pairing up gets you more kicks. It gets you to help each other. It gets you to say, come on, mate, you can do this better. Again, all of that. Reminders on your equipment. Put something on your... True. Do not write up your arm, be calm. Because if I'm standing here, I'm going, God, I've got this person already. Right? Put in something on your shoe, bright colour, um, different colour shoelaces. And when your head goes down, 
think, ah, get the next one. Get the next one. What's my plan? All right, so you start to actually put all of this on there. Um, before a game, they're the things I would make uh, anyone when they're first starting do. Uh, how do you feel? What are you up to? Target. What do you want to do in this game? And it might be get 20 possessions. Would that be a fair thing? 20 possessions? 20 possessions? So what are your actions? You want to get 20 possessions? Someone tell me. I want to get 20 possessions in a game. What are my actions? Give me one. I like, so what does that mean though? <coughs> work rate means what? I could be running all around the outside. I might, I might do laps. That's work rate. But what, is, what do we actually want more? So to get my 20 possessions, what am I going to do? Excellent. Number one, go to the fall of the ball. Get to the fall of the ball. That's a good one, isn't it? Straight away. I'm thinking about that. What's the next one? Oh, I love that. Yeah, chat. Now, how many times do you do drills on just talking? Lucky I haven't been out here because you'd all be doing twinkle, twinkle, little star and all of these as you are actually handballing or doing drills. We don't teach talking. We don't practice talking and yet we say talk when we get on the field. Would that be right? We need to practice that. So you, Ellen will tell you when I do running drills with people, they actually have to sing songs and everything, yell out people's names. Because again, if you want to have it work in a game, practice it. So again, talking, getting the fall of the ball. What else can get me 20 possessions? Yeah, what did I say before we were doing? Yeah. Pair up. Pair up. Get someone else. Wax a little bit. Get one going past. Sometimes that makes you, if you're nervous, and we're paired up and I get the ball, come past, get an easy one. You go, no, that was all right. I'm starting to feel better. All right, these are the ways we can get people into games. So again, each one of those has a target. Uh, get more ta Get so many tackles in a game. That Let's say I want to get... Uh, 10 tackles in a game. Josh, action. What is one? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Get, how about get close to the person? Because my brother calls these shopping shopping trolley tackles. They're really good for doing your uh, ACLs. So if you Solid. actually get close. <laughs> so number one, number one, get close. AC joint, sorry. Uh, get close. What else can we get to get 20 tackles? Wash your hips. Sorry? Ah, excellent. Yeah, wash the hips. When we're actually watch where someone's... What else? Ah, exactly right. So you might actually go, well, this guy's always around. Get, get around there. So again, it might be get to the fall of the ball. Might be another one. But instead of things just happening to you as players, you start to focus on... And coaches can actually go, especially you can decide you've got five players, you want to do something in particular... Tell them what it is and then say, these are the three things I expect. Do you see how all of a sudden things don't just happen when we play? We become great players because we work on it. When everyone else is doing, just going out there. Teams I work with go now. We're going to get better all the time. At the bottom, if I make a mistake, I'm not in the flow, physically what do I do? What I can always do is I can run or I can actually talk to someone or do something like that mentally. I always picture myself, I've got, we've got two staffies at home. <coughs> when we were young, we used to put on, the song we went out beforehand was Hungry Like the Wolf. We used to put two songs on before as the cross players we went out. One was Hurt So Good because we used to say, come on, baby, make it hurt because we got smashed with sticks. So make it hurt so good. And the other one was Hungry Like the Wolf because getting the ball was just like hunting in packs and being there. So, again, what you hear, what you're doing is important for all of that. So it was just get the ball. Then on the back, every game, after every game, I would really like you to just do some of this. Three things you did really well today. You need to work out, what did I do really well today? Then three things I need to do better and who's going to help you or what are you going to do at training to be better? You can do that. Remember, people are different. Find out about the anxiety. One of your targets might be hit the field feeling great. So it might be practicing my center in breath during the week, do it before I go out there and put on some good songs and notice my heart rate for the first time. It might be take a drink. It might be uh, to have a red frog before I go out there and feel like a god. Give me any of these things. Practice it and have a go. Um, direct feedback in an uh, atmosphere of care. And last one I'm going to show you is just a little bit of this, group influences. You all think you're the same. You all think you don't do anything. Conformity. Positions of power. Have a look, just in case you think you're all individuals. To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this one would stand up at the sound of this tone, simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. 
or would you? After just three beats, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the groove. You wouldn't be like that, would you? But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone. The crowd is gone and nobody is watching her except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? <laughs> she's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Thanks so much. I think she'll teach the new guy what to do. Oh. <laughs> We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Here to explain what's going on in your brain is Jonah Berger of the University of Pennsylvania. This sort of internalized form of herd behavior is part of what we call social learning. Starting at a very early age, when we see members of our group perform a task, our brains literally reward us for following in their footsteps. When I saw everybody stand up, I felt like I needed to join them. Otherwise, I'm like excluded. Once I decided to go with it, then I felt much more comfortable. Conformity is how we become socialized, but it can also cause us to develop bad habits or repeat past wrongs. And it's why even this rebel, who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks. Now, I want to show you that because... more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act is that similar forces are subconsciously shaping the way you think right now. So all the time, people go, this is what Kahneman won his Nobel Prize for. We all think we don't act like a herd, and we do. And we need to make sure that the herd is right. So here's the last experiment I'm going to show you today. Imagine, what's your name? Justin. Justin, come over here, Justin. Sit in this chair. Who's this with you? Harrison. Harrison, come and sit in this chair. I've got Justin and Harrison, and I'm the experimenter, and we're going to do this experiment today, you guys. And one of you... Um, is going to be the experimentor and one of the experimentee, all right? What you don't know is before Justin and I had gotten together and he knew exactly which straw to pick, all right? So he picks the short straw, you pick the, oh, sorry, he picks the long straw, you pick the short straw, and I go, you're going to be the person we experiment on. And the really good thing about this experiment is, is that learning helps pain. Pain helps learning. And the way we're going to inflict pain is we're going to put uh, electricity bolts through you. Is that that's fine, isn't it? Yep. yep you know, like, uh, sorry, through you. For you, you're the testing. Um, we're going to put an electricity bolt. You're going to be doing the, doing it for us, all right? Exactly like that. Um, you're now saying, oh, I've got a bit of a heart condition. Is that okay? I've got a bit of a heart condition. Is that okay? Yes, yes. It'll be fine. But before you do this on him in this other room, he'll be in the other room. You'll be in this one administering it. Come over to this room. So we take you over there and we put the thing on you and we put 50 volts through it. And what would you probably go? Oh, that hurts a bit. Yes, because it truly does. All right, so this is how this experiment was set up. You now go over 
into the room where you're going to be. You stay where you are. You're over in the room. Off you go. He's now over in the room. You're about to use the electricity. All right? Come and sit with him. He goes right up to, goes right up to uh, 360 volts. Who thinks they would electrocute someone through the death here? Hands up if you think you would. Hands up if you honestly think you might. What, with that or if you could do it to someone? No, you, this is the experiment. You have to, you're, you're part of the experiment. So he was one person that was doing it. There was more and more and more. Have a look what happens. So Milgram, Stanley Milgram wanted to know why do people do bad things? Why did all the Essendon players take drug supplements? Have a look at this and start to understand when the most significant people in the club say this is important, have a look what happens. So what you find out is he was never mic'd up. What the participants don't know is that the learner hasn't been receiving any shots. He doesn't get any shots whatsoever. Let me out. out. Let me out. His responses are being played on a pre-recorded CD. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out. Um, when I get to intense shock, and then extreme intensity shock, and then dangerous severe shock, I need to stop really, don't I? Well, the experiment requires that you continue. What about in dangerous severe shock, and then the XX then? Well, please continue, just continue the experiment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The participant here deferring to the professor, yes. and that deferring to the professor carries with it a diffusion of responsibility. Yes. The responsibility for this is not entirely hers, so much as it is to the authority figure that resides with her in the room. We're in danger now. Yeah. But you say it won't be really dangerous to him. There's no lasting tissue damage. Okay. And he signed his form and everything, didn't he? He cited his form and everything, didn't he? Yeah. So he was okay with it. Okay. Paper A cup, B wall. It was scary days, I think, correct? Two ends on 25 volts. Let me out Let me out Let me out Number three. Well, it's a classic example of what Milgram shows. Somebody who, at face value, poses no threat to anybody, can, in these kinds of circumstances, proceed to the point of inflicting severe levels of pain. The A cup, B ball, C airplane, or D lampshade. You, you have to treat the absence of response as a wrong answer and just continue the procedure. Okay, no response is wrong answer. 390 volts. <laughs> so now he's gone silent. So after the <laughs> protest from the learner in the other room, the idea is now that the learner goes silent. So potentially there is the idea that these shocks have actually either rendered the learner unconscious or possibly even killed them. C chain or D bicycle. Okay. I was not responding, so that it counts as a wrong answer. Okay. <laughs> I'll run out to the Four hundred and five volts. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect, 225. Let me out of here! Let me out of here! Let me out! I'm not sure if I'm happy to continue doing this with him. He really sounds like he's in a lot of pain. Well, the experiment requires that you go on. No, I know, but I don't, I don't really take any pleasure in putting that through a human being's arm. No, but this is an experiment. It's essential that you continue. Where did I get to? Number three. Uh, interesting. Okay, the reason I show you that is that most people don't think they would ever do that. 70% of people go through to actually killing to the extent where they would be dead. And they've recently, we were not, we're not allowed to, as psychologists do that experiment anymore 
because people were really disappointed in themselves. They would think I would never do something like that and then when they actually were someone, they went, wow, I can't believe I would do something. They have just replicated that for the first time ever in one of the scan um, one of the Slovenia or one of those areas, I can't remember which one of it was. This time, every time it's been done before, which is about 50 times, it was about 70%. This time it was 85%. They're thinking that people are becoming more conforming to doing what that now because of social media. So what I'm actually asking you is, when Essendon were told, do whatever it takes, the words on the wall, yes, we'll do this, and who did they trust? Trust was a word on the wall. They trust their coaches and everything. When I showed this to lawyers, I'm going, I did not blame the players because how hard do you think it is to go against things like that? So in a club, you need to understand, do good things. Check, question all the time help each other and understand that if someone's doing something wrong, it is really hard to actually say don't do it. You know how you need to do it as a captain? If you don't like it, you need a seconder and a thirder to go, yep, come on, we're going to do this differently. It really takes having someone else. And as young men, I want you to know this because young men get in trouble sometimes because the leader of your group does something stupid and people go along with it. <coughs> this is how there has been rape charges. This is how there's been lots of really bad stuff and it's good guys that get caught up in it because they don't know how to get around authority. So if someone's absolutely pissed and doing something wrong, I want you to understand it takes a lot to stand up to it, but the more you know about it, the easier it actually is. And that's why I'm saying there's all this group stuff that can determine how good you are on a field. If one person is your captain and they're slack, they take most people along with that. If they do extra work and go, come on, and they care, they actually take people with them. And so, in other words, when I came here originally, someone asked me to see Josh. And Josh was good enough to come along and he said I could say this. He was good enough to come along to my house. I couldn't have worked with what I think is a nicer bloke. I said to my husband, I've been at a women's conference all morning, and I said, Josh just made my day. Coming and meeting someone that I think truly does want to get better takes people to help. And so when John asked me originally to do this, I said, I will do it on the proviso that we understand you're a team. And for any behaviour to improve, it means you've got to pair up. You've got to have teams. You have to have team decisions. So, for instance, if he starts to feel hot or this, off, go. Do the centering breath. Know how to do that. Practice it as a group. You can be awesome. You can all feel better about yourselves. You can have great lives if you start to practice this and understand it. I'm around to help when people need. And for me, it is an absolute privilege to say to work with a group of men instead of one at a time or elite guys who get shoved in a AFL system when this happens to them all the time and then by the time they, I see them, they're broken. And how are we doing that to our young men? So I want you to feel like gods when you're playing. But that means if their coach says you need to do something extra, go and do it or find a different way of doing it or go and find an expert who's an old bloke and go, you come and help me, have a few more tips. I'll shake your tea on Thursday night. Guess what? Makes you better. Makes the old guy feel good about himself. So you asking me makes me feel good about myself tonight because I think you can be great. So um, I have one of Ken Hinckley there. And at the start, all he does is ask everyone, it's the end of a match on 10.30 at night, 11.30 p.m. versus Brisbane and they lost. And he says, is anyone tired? What do you think the answer should be? Yes. Yes. Who would put their hand up, do they think, to say that? 11.30 at night, you've played, you've lost, but you've played. Who at the end of a game here would give themselves a 9 or a 10 out of 10 for effort? Who would give themselves a 9 or a 10 for effort, most games? Yeah. Who would give themselves? Come on, who would give themselves a 9 out of 10? The only thing that should take your 9 or 10 away is if you are anxious. Because if you're anxious, you might want to be great, but you're just not getting there. But on effort, if you're a 9 or a 10, these guys have a lot of guys that are 9 or a 10. This is what he says. Who's tired? Not one person puts their hand up. One guy does. So one guy puts his hand up and says, I'm tired. And he says, you'll be tired by the time I'm finished with you, you smart ass. So again, group behaviour. What do you think is going to happen next time you ask something? No one's going to say anything. People will shut up. 
rather than actually say something because they get too worried they're going to be in trouble. So as a team, you need to have an atmosphere where it's not you you have guidelines. You have things that you want to do. The captain might say something, you might say, "Oh yeah, that's a really good idea." But what about this too? Could we do this? How about this? And you need to have some fun and you need to have this shared silliness every now and then, which means put a big Watching kicking and screaming, watch things that are fun together so that when you go out in a footy field and things are tense, you say something and you laugh about it. And all of a sudden people are going, oh, yeah, now I'm back in the zone again. This is really important for people to understand. And it takes hard work like anything else. Port, I think, are getting back to helping rather than hindering their stars. Make yourself big. Music, distraction, counting, touch, voice and care, fun drills. Coaches need to put people out feeling good. Before a game, oh, yeah, you can do this. John Cale was a great coach. He was not a good tactician. He was not great at teaching people lots of extra stuff. He was the best person at making people on game day feel like, you can do this for me. Go on, show me what you can do. Because on game day, it's what you can do, not what you can't do that counts. So, again, that's there. Um, these are all my sources of confidence, and you need to know it. Going back to entropy, you've heard a lot of stuff tonight. Take one thing, take two things, do the centering breath, buy a book if you want to be great. All of this stuff, read it, underline it, do this and understand that some of you could have been 20% better two years ago. If you had this, all of a sudden we never learn this stuff. Take it, captains, read it, Be inspire other people to go there. And remember the answer is if you do the extra work, if you do the hours, if you try and bloody hard, you're in the A grade. If you're trying hard and you haven't quite got the hours and you're not quite doing the extra time, I still love you. You're in my B grade. You'll get there when you do the other stuff. So we're going to help everyone. So um, for me, as I said, this is what I do. My book is full of practical ideas and it's not just about footy. What you've learnt tonight, when you're annoyed at someone, practice it. When something's going wrong, practice it. So that you get, if you've got uni exams, practice it. So that I live everything I talk about. My husband will say, you've got to have fun in life. Life's way too short and I lost a brother at 29. Mark's twin died. I'm going to tell you, I n never had that day. I was coming back from America with my friends. We'd all played with Sassy. We'd been to every American college in lacrosse. No one had ever done anything like it. Got to Melbourne and I had my sister-in-law's uh, sister standing at the airport telling me my brother had been killed. It was a day I never had. I missed that day with the international dateline. Every day I honour him with actually having fun, doing this, helping other people. Don't let life be a burden on any of you. And if you ever get to the stage where you're feeling really shit, make sure you find someone like me. And I don't have to do one at a time. Lots of people. And enjoy this. And maybe at some stage I'll come and take a training for you because that's the thing. You've got to actually love being here. You've got to be a group of mates. And in 20 years' time, you've got to be back here like these guys at the bar, having tea, helping other kids be great too. So thank you for staying. Thank you to all of you for giving me the opportunity. Hope you learned something. Hope you had some fun. Thanks again. That was uh, riveting stuff. And uh, honestly, for uh, two hours of uh, guys focused on you and uh, not wavering was pretty sensational because we can get lost in two hours. But your talk tonight was absolutely sensational. And... Uh, I wish I had you when I was playing footy because I know it would have been much better. But I know you guys will take a lot on board and uh, we start from here, fellas. And uh, thank Jen again for coming along and the family as well. Thank you. And please say hi when you see us in the street. And if you've got any injuries, see Mark because he's a bloody smart doctor. He sits on the end of the continuum. <laughs>